we're going to be looking at something really important. Uh, in fact, it's so important, we're going to spend two weeks uh, discussing the topic. Now, there's a very important point to this morning's uh, message, uh, and then there will be a, a very important point next week that will build on what we learned here this morning. Now, some sermons we preach end with a call to action, right? That could be repent, that could be go love. Uh, sometimes we preach sermons that answer questions. Uh, man, I'm confused about this, and we look to God's word to get comfort and peace. Uh, but at other, other times, we preach sermons so that, so that our theological knowledge increases. Now, that, that, that's funny language. We don't speak like that often. But many times, there are uh, confusing aspects about following Jesus. And I would submit to you this morning, uh, one of those is the practice of Christian spirituality. Uh, anytime we start talking about something that you can't see, uh, it can be confusing. Anytime we start talking about spirits or spiritual things, I mean, we can't put our hands on those things. It can be hard to grasp. For example, let's look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. Uh, this text is going to give rise to some questions. And the goal of this morning is to bring as much clarity around this notion of spirituality as we can. So let's read together. Look at it. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is what the Spirit, this is the Spirit of the Antichrist, John says, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. So already we're getting this language about the Spirit of God, Spirit of Antichrist, testing the spirits. You will know this is the Spirit of God, this kind of language. Verse 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Now, now we're talking about things being in the world and, and this spirit being in us. Verse 5, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world and the world listens to them. That's those spirits that are of the Antichrist or that are not of God. Verse 6, we are from God. Whoever knows, God's, whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. Get it? <laughs> By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Lots of language around spiritual stuff. So let's contemplate this idea again, the practice of Christian spirituality. Now, to lay some groundwork, uh, let's, let's consider the scope of religion uh, in a general way. Some folks uh, adhere to the idea of hedonism. And what that means is their spiritual perspective or their worldview uh, essentially says the right and good thing, the good practice of religion, is to pursue as much pleasure in the flesh and on earth that you can consume. In fact, the act of getting pleasure, no matter how you do it, is actually a good thing. It's kind of God-like. It's driven by experience and pleasure. So you have this one way of thinking that's really grounded and rooted in flesh, in stuff, and the, the religious payoff, so to speak, is pleasure. Now, aside from that, some people uh, adhere to asceticism. <laughs> now, now, their view would be any kind of pleasure should be avoided at all costs. Because then you might like it, it might entrap you, it could cause you to only pursue pleasure. So, so their mind is to reject all pleasure. You know, we see this in, in to give you sort of what we're talking about, uh, almost like this, this is not the case, but I want you to see what I'm, what I'm talking about. Maybe like an Amish or Mennonite community. Now their roots are in Christianity, so don't confuse what I'm saying. But there is a thrust there to avoid all worldly things and pleasure. So some people take this radical view. Their worldview would be to avoid all things of earth and set our minds on things in heaven. 
Now, there's an aspect of that in Christianity. Not to be people of the world, but to have our minds on heavenly things. Now, to further bring confusion around this topic of spirituality, some people believe in this notion of transcendentalism. That is this. It's crazy. We, we, this is weird speak to us. Many Eastern uh, religions are, are rooted in this kind of thinking that really, none of this really even exists. Reality is just an illusion. And if you can meditate deep enough, detach from your body enough, you can have these out-of-body experiences. And, and man, if you really work hard and do a lot of confusing things, you can even arise to a state of nirvana. That is totally separate from here, and you become God like yourself. So there's all of this worldview wrapped around these ideas of spirituality. So how do we make sense of this when it comes to Christianity? You see, what I, what I want to unpack for us is Christianity uh, is very unique in that there is God in heaven, right? He is spirit. But he comes to and dwell in us while we're here on earth so that then with God's spirit, we can move into the world and in a, in a sense, present God's kingdom to others centered around Christ and his love and the redemption. So look, if somebody asked you about Christianity, it's likely we would not bring up the Holy Spirit in our first conversation. It's likely we would say, well, First thing is, don't, don't go seek pleasure in these ways. And we would listen. See, we would, we would be focused on pleasure. Or we would say, well, what you need to know is there is another world. There is somewhere in heaven. And we may not really understand or even be able to articulate that the beauty of Christianity is that God, through redemption in Christ, His atoning work on the cross, man, He will come and indwell the believer. We get indwelled by God's Spirit. We get indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a profound statement I want you to catch. This is what I want you to see. This is what God wants us to see. Get it? The Holy Spirit is the point at which the Trinity, the triune Godhead, becomes personal to the believer. You see, God is in heaven and we're here. But man, it is you. That the way God becomes personal to us is through the Holy Spirit. In fact, I would even submit to you, <laughs> man, it's God's plan that through us, with His Spirit, we go into the world and do the work that He's called us to do. Now, so the goal this morning is to get a sense, a biblical rooted sense about truths of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to do this in two ways. Uh, we're going to look at uh, His nature and also His work. We're going to look at the nature of the Holy Spirit, and then we're going to look at the work of the Holy Spirit. But look, I want you to catch this. There are reasons that this study is very important. We already stated one, because the Holy Spirit is the point at which God becomes personal to us. You see, we can identify with a father figure. That makes sense, right? Father in heaven. We can identify... With the Son of God being here on earth, testified through history, we have His Word. But the concept of the Holy Spirit is difficult to grasp. Next, get this. Uh, it's important because we need to realize in the scope of biblical history, the Holy Spirit and His work is most prominent now of the Trinity. Now, God's still in control. Jesus is still the one through which we receive forgiveness. But it's the Holy Spirit that's working in our lives today. We see God the Father really display His work on earth in the Old Testament. Jesus clearly, throughout the Gospels until His ascension, was the primary way the Trinity was at work here on earth. Then Jesus left, told His disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait on the Holy Spirit. That's the day of Pentecost. Jesus went away, quoted Joel. Holy Spirit will come and will give you power. And didn't it happen on the day of Pentecost? Sure it did. So we live in the era where God's plan primarily is to relate to us through the Holy Spirit. It's important that we grasp this aspect. Now, it's also a really good thing that this is God's plan 
for, for our culture today. Doesn't our culture just have a, a focus on the experience? It's getting that next experience. Some do this through drugs. It's that experience. And we're pursuing something real. We're abandoning old structures of institutions and organizations and looking for something new, seeking these uh, experiences. Some do it through risky adventures. Hey, there, there are places where you can go and pay $150 and, and they'll like map out a course for you. You can run and crawl through mud, crawl over hay bales. They'll squirt you with water and you get a t-shirt at the end, but you know what you have? Man, you've got a great experience, right? Some people pay $80 to run a marathon in a, in a city. Uh, I was stupid enough to try that one time. Uh, but don't we want to just go tell everybody about our experiences? Man, I, I felt alive. It was real. You know, it's, it's this drive. The college experience. Well, it's not the education. We need the college experience. Don't movies try to give us that experience? They try to catch us away into this dream world. And then we leave and we're like, oh, man, that was so intense. That, well, we literally are just sitting and watching. We're not doing anything, but we truly are looking for that experience. Even in sports. Man, Cheryl's like, Ricky, quiet down. Why are you yelling at the TV? But I get caught up into this experience. Some even toward uh, later years that, that we talk about this bucket list. Don't we kind of feel like we've missed out if we don't have some experiences? Well, I've got to experience Alaska. If I could just make it out west. You know, if I could just do that for life. You know, we just need something real. Friend, this is the good thing. We can feel God's presence. We literally can have something real living inside of us with a sort of special tangibility. Not that we can put our finger on it, but man, God really is moving in my heart. He is really living in me. See, that's God's plan that we experience this. So next, look, there are some difficulties, though. We've acknowledged a few of them. One is this, that we have less explicit, clear revelation about the Holy Spirit in Scripture than we do about the Father and Son. Now, the thing is, if, bear with me a bit, there, there are no systematic descriptions, discourses, full teachings in the Bible that can be found about the Holy Spirit altogether in one place. John chapters 14 through 16 might be the closest but it can be difficult to get a clear sense of the Holy Spirit. And oftentimes, uh, you'll see it today, scriptures that are pertaining to the Holy Spirit are often tied up uh, with other stuff. Now, now, just to show you the, the opposite, uh, we have in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul <laughs> spent I mean, multiple chapters. Uh, and you could even say the whole book the full book of Romans to explain what salvation is to us. Man, he presents arguments, supports those arguments, then attacks it from a different angle, supports that, then he refutes false teachings, false thought, and then he roots it in the Old Testament using analogies. So, man, it's pretty, if, if we can use the word easy, easy to go to places like that and get a clear sense of what salvation is. But unfortunately, we don't have that for the Holy Spirit. And then, as I referred to early, earlier, we just don't have concrete imagery for the Holy Spirit like we do uh, like we do for the Father and Son. An important note here, too. Another reason this is so important. Don't we often view, if we're not careful, the Holy Spirit as being less than the Father and the Son in the Trinity? Way back years ago in church history, because Jesus came on earth, there was a group called the Arians that thought somehow Jesus was not fully God, that he was less than God. And I'm afraid this same mindset, without acknowledging it, may exist in us. Just to, this, is, this might sting you a little bit, but huh, when's the last time we have prayed? 
to the Holy Spirit. See, that he is fully God, and we're going to see that. Friend, I'm afraid. What, what, if, what if we were missing out on the fullness, the fullness of God in our life? Because maybe we don't understand. And it's hard to understand. It's hard for me to understand about the Holy Spirit. So we're going to get into it. This is what I'd like to do. I'm going to, I'm going to avoid as much confusion as possible. So I'm going to first look at the nature of the Holy Spirit. Establish His nature. And then from there we're going to move in. We're going to look in Scripture at the Holy Spirit's work. We're going to look at His work in the Old Testament. And then we're going to look at his work uh, in the life of Jesus. And then next week, we're going to look at the work of the Holy Spirit in us. That's going to be the whole sermon of next week. So the goal this morning to restate is to give us confidence about our thinking of the Holy Spirit. And man, just one last little tidbit. I don't know if you've ever looked at... Uh, an old King James version of the Bible, they actually called him the Holy Ghost. So, so then all of a sudden we get this idea that there's like a white sheet. You know, see, there's all this confusion. Man, and the Lord, with his help, we're going to clear it up this morning. Are you with me? Yes. Uh, <laughs> good deal. A lot, of, a lot of intense looks this morning, which, which I enjoy. All right, so, first of all, the Holy Spirit is God. Man, check it out. Acts in 5. Peter, remember when Ananias and Sapphira hid the money and they lied? He said, why has Satan filled your heart? To lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself some of the money. You have not lied to man, but you have lied to God. You see, Peter understood lying to the Holy Spirit is lying to God. 1 Corinthians over in 3. By the way, I'm going to make all of these notes available online. They'll be hooked to the sun you stop me, I'll email them to you. Uh, so you can double check what I'm saying. Uh, he said uh, over in 1 Corinthians, Don't you know that you are God's temple? And that God's spirit dwells in you? So he is deity. The Holy Spirit is God. First of all, we know this by the attributes he possesses. He's all-knowing. Check this out. 1 Corinthians, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. This is it right here. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. The Holy Spirit is God. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. Luke one thirty five. the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come to you. This is wrapped around Jesus' birth. And the power, the power of the capitalized Most High will come on you. The Holy Spirit is the power of God. And he'll do it uh, through the Holy Spirit. Next, the Holy Spirit is eternal. Speaking of redemption in Hebrews, that's the context. It states this. Get this. How much more will the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God? To purify our conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. The Holy Spirit did not start on Pentecost. He is eternal. He is God. Even the Holy Spirit accomplishes divine work. Second Peter. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by, guess what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. He is eternal. He is all-knowing. And get it again, He is the point at which God comes personal to us and indwells us. He is the connection. Bear with me. Permit me to use the terms. He is the connection between the transcendental and the earth. The uh, other earth to earth. He's our connection next. I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is a distinct personality. You see, there's this false perception that somehow he's like a force. He, he's like, Luke, I am your father, you know. It's just this magical, mysterious force. He is God, but he's also a distinct personality. We know it these ways. 
In Scripture, he is referred to as him. Jesus promising he would send the Holy Spirit says it this way. I tell you the truth, it's better that I go away. But if, because if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. He is a masculine personality. And get this idea. He's a personal agent in John 14. The helper. He is an agent. He's the helper. The Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Are you seeing how we're giving shape a, a, an, an intellectual framework about the Holy Spirit? Next, I want you to notice this. The Holy Spirit is one person of the Trinity. In John 16, we see this. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. He is part of the Trinity with a certain function. He is that connector. Matthew 28, we see this evident, right? Baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To belabor the point over in Jude, this is really cool. He said, pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God and wait for the mercy of Jesus Christ. You see, each person in the Trinity, man, they're one, they're God, they're eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, the doing of divine work, right? But there is something about the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and Jesus the Son. One more, 1 Peter. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of His Spirit for obedience to Jesus. Man, isn't that cool? God here is portrayed as being sovereign, the foreknowledge of God. The sanctification comes through the Spirit in obedience to Jesus. You see, we just don't spend much time thinking, contemplating, how is the Holy Spirit at work in my life? How does the Holy Spirit affect how I relate to God? How I'm able to obey Jesus? He is a distinct personality. Get this. Because he possesses personal characteristics. We've seen the Holy Spirit has intelligence. He can think. He is God. He has knowledge. He has a will, a plan. And he has emotions. Those things make up a personality. They are the fundamental elements of personhood. Now, he has the ability to be affected. Isn't that something? Boy, isn't that interesting? We, I'm not saying control, shape, but we affect God. We affect his Holy Spirit. You see, when we start talking about this, pretty quick, life has meaning. Fairly quickly, obedience matters. Attitudes really are attitudes. Love or lack of love, is they are real conditions because we can affect the Holy Spirit. Get this, Acts 5, we read it earlier. They lied to the Holy Spirit. Over in Ephesians 4, boy, this one hurts my heart. There's instructions about not grieving the Holy Spirit. Bear with me, friend, but think about it deeply. There, it, it could be, really, it could be that the Holy Spirit is moving, desiring, pushing us, so to speak, to do something, to change, conviction, all these ways... And by rejecting, ignoring, clouding the mind so we don't have to acknowledge it, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. First Thessalonians, there's this idea about quenching the Holy Spirit. Doing things that, that, that depress or quench His intended work. You see, God can do anything, but He's trying to do it through us, and we can quench His Holy Spirit. We can resist the Holy Spirit. Back where I'm from... 
seemed like all the preachers had the old uh, conversion story. You know, they, they would say something like, yeah, I was the rebellious teen in the, in the back of the church with them white knuckles, boy, gripping that, that pew because I wasn't going to come forward. But man, the conviction of the Holy Spirit fell on me. And man, I just couldn't help it. I just had to go for it, repent, give my life to Jesus. Don't we resist sometimes, though? Don't we do that? Man, Lord, I know why I feel it. I know what you want me to do. You're convicting me about this sin. I know that person needs a friend. Lord, I know that's the right thing. Boy, and I just resist it at all costs sometimes. Know it, though, we can affect the Holy Spirit. Last thing, we can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, all right, so look, the Holy Spirit's a person, not a force. That person is God. Just as fully in the same way as the Father and the Son. Last thing. Uh, before we move on to his work, the Holy Spirit engages in moral action. He, he does this throughout Scripture. Teaching, regenerating, searching hearts, speaking, interceding through prayer, testifying. I'll leave you with this, Romans 8. Likewise, the Spirit helps us. Paul said, he helps us in our weakness. Sometimes we don't know what to pray. We don't pray as we ought. Paul said, the Spirit himself prays for us. Are you getting some confidence about the Holy Spirit? Don't you kind of know about his nature now? He's God. He's a real personality. So quickly, just so we can get a well-rounded appreciation, theological framework about the Holy Spirit, let's look briefly at his work in the Old Testament. In creation, we see God created the heavens and the earth, and his Spirit hovered over the waters, right? The giving of prophecy in Ezekiel says it like this. The prophet said, God said unto me, Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak with you. And he spoke to me. The Spirit entered into me and he set me on my feet. And then the prophet talks about all the stuff he heard and he starts prophesying to the nation. Next thing we see in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit conveys certain skills to certain people to accomplish certain tasks. When they were building the, the tabernacle, it said of one man that God filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge, get it, for craftsmanship. This particular man was moved on by the Holy Spirit and gifted in these ways to accomplish carpentry. The Holy Spirit empowers leaders. You remember all those fascinating and fantastic stories in the book of Judges. Gideon, before he has success with only 300 men, the original 300 story, by the way. It says of him, but the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. Man, you remember Samson. When he came to Lehi, you know all the fightings that were going on, the battles with the Philistines. They came shouting at him. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed on him. And the ropes that were in his arms broke him right off, right? So we see the Holy Spirit in action. King Saul, we remember, was anointed and he prophesied. King David, over in Samuel. Samuel anoints him. Get this, man. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed on David from that day forward. Sometimes in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit shows up instantaneously and temporarily. Other times, we have it here. Man, when he was anointed as king by Samuel, boy, boy, you just sensed it. The Holy Spirit came on David. And he was different from that day forward. Just brainstorm with me here. Haven't you known that person before? That, that boy, you could just almost say, man, that guy's been anointed with the Holy Spirit. Boy, there's just something I get around him or her. Jeez, man, I can just feel it off of it, right? It, sometimes it's a joy that's unimaginable. Sometimes, friend, I believe it's the Holy Spirit on somebody. Sometimes it's wisdom and knowledge. How, how can anybody be that smart or wise? Man, I would submit to you, it's the Holy Spirit. How can they be that capable? Man, I'm thinking, friend, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to be on you, in you. Right? We're going to end with that today. Work in the life of Jesus. Just to show you again the relationship between Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. At his birth, 
Holy Spirit is involved in it. Mary, the ho Holy Spirit's going to come on you. <laughs> and the Most High will be in you, right? In his baptism. Everybody's standing around looking. John baptizing. What's happening? The Holy Spirit descends onto Jesus in the, what they saw as a dove, right? A tangible form of a dove. And then God from heaven says what? This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. We see God the Father sending the Holy Spirit to rest on God the Son. In his public ministry, it's said of Jesus, he was full of the Holy Spirit when he was out there doing his ministry. In his teaching, Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to spend just a minute here on this, and then we're going to close. In his miracles, remember the story of Matthew 12? Demon man comes, he's healed by Jesus. What do the Pharisees say? They say of Jesus, he's a false prophet. That miracle occurred by the power of the devil. Beelzebub is the word they used. They said about Jesus, he, he performed that miracle with the power of the prince of the demons. And then Jesus gives us those famous scriptures. Well, that doesn't make sense, he said. A house working against itself is not going to last. But he says, but if it's by the Spirit of God that I'm casting out these demons, then the kingdom of heaven is among you. Now, this is what's chilling. Jesus concludes with these words in, in rebuttal to the Pharisees. I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. You know what I'm about to say. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, he can be forgiven. Jesus, talk bad about me, you'll be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Even in this age or in the age to come. Now see, I want, I want you to get this. Uh, this is important. <laughs> The Holy Spirit, man, is the essence of God made available to man. We'll get this. The essence of God being made available to man, in this case a tangible form even with healing, and the onlookers say that's a Now, I don't know why there's all this confusion around what the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is about this unpardonable sin. It's the essence of God moving in the presence of man and someone saying, that's of the devil. Scary thing, man. Scary thing. Do you see the importance of the Holy Spirit even in the mind of Jesus, that God's Son? So look, to conclude, what, what, you, what we need to know. The Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity, right? The Holy Spirit is fully divine. The Holy Spirit is one with the Father and the Son. And in, well, this is beauty. In the Holy Spirit, the triune God comes close. This is the last one. We're going to build on this next one. We are initiated into the Christian life through the Holy Spirit's activity in our conversion and regeneration. And we're going to build on this next week. This idea of conversion. This is the point at which we turn to God. Now there's a negative element involved with conversion and that is repenting of sin and turning away from sin. And then there's this positive element of placing our faith in God and accepting the promises of the work of Jesus. We see that in Romans, right? Confession, believing with the heart, and then we will be saved. And then also, in the beginning of the Christian experience, there's this idea of regeneration. And that's the idea of this miraculous transformation of us. And then there's this implementation of spiritual energy. Paul said it like this. <laughs> when we get saved, God gives us the power 
to become children of God. In another place, he says, we move from death unto life. We identify with death and we're raised to walk in newness of life. Speaking of conviction, hear me, friend, we're closing. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin. Because they do not believe in me, he says later. I want to be really sensitive. Perhaps the Holy Spirit's convicting some of us in the room. Friend, I would say, I would say repent. I would say don't resist. Don't quench. Don't frustrate. Hey, don't lie to the Holy Spirit. Right? I would say repent, abandon. Abandon sin. Turn to the Lord. Put your faith in Him. Believe on the good, atoning work of Jesus. Next, there's this idea over in John about regeneration. Boy, this is it, man. John 3, 5. Remember when Nicodemus comes to Jesus? He's asking him all about how to... How? Nicodemus, Jesus, think about it. I can see it. Okay, we're down here. How do I get up there? How do I get eternal life? Isn't that the question he's asking? How do I, how do I go beyond just this stuff? How do I have eternal life with God? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born of water, speaking of the part of the water in the birth, right? Born of the flesh, born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. To that which is born of the flesh, it's just flesh. And that which is born of the spirit, this new life, this spiritual life, is a spiritual life, right? Don't be surprised, he said. Don't, do not marvel that I said unto you, you must be born again. Now Jesus, he's always honest. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Then look how he finishes here. This is so interesting. The next verse, Jesus says this. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear it sound. But you do not know where it's coming from. And you don't know where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born in the Spirit. Well, this is a chilling time. Think about it. What if we're sitting here being convicted by the Holy Spirit? Now, we don't know where it's coming from. We're feeling it. Man. Friend, we don't know where he's going to go next. So I say this. We're, we're coming to a close. That's right. Now, this sermon's all about us gaining a better understanding, a truthful knowledge of the Holy Spirit. But I want to say, friend, right now, God wishes, like we talked about, He wishes to literally indwell our hearts. So God is asking, man, come unto me, right? Repent. You're feeling convicted. Repent. Turn from your wicked ways. And put your faith in a loving God. And when we do, friend, the Holy Spirit goes to work. Don't he? Yeah. Conversion. We are made right in the sight of God. He brings up new life in us. So I'll be available down.